how to balance between making peace and speaking the truth in intimate relations. What if truth hurts the other or two sides conflict? Well, you can be absolutely certain that that's going to happen. I mean, look, the first thing, that's a really good question. That's from Vincent. It's a really good question. It's a really difficult question. The first thing you have to decide is, this goes back to what I was discussing about 10 minutes ago, about what your aims are. You know, your whole, the whole way you perceive the world is dependent on what your, on the aim of your ethical structure. And so that ethical structure is, is a, is a, it's a hierarchy with something at the top that's of crucial importance. And Carl Jung would say that whatever's at the top of your ethical hierarchy functions psychologically as if it's God for you. It's because it's the highest of all possible values. And you could think of God in that sense as a personality that perhaps a personality that you're trying to mimic because a value structure actually constitutes a personality that you're trying to act out or mimic. And so the highest element in that personality structure would be the most valuable portion of that personality. You might say, well, what do you want? What do you want? If you could have what you wanted, if you could knock and the door would open, so to speak, and if you could ask and you would receive, what would you want? And and that means what would you give? What would you give? What would you be willing to give up important things for? How would you prioritize, which is the same as giving up important things? And it's not easy to come to terms with what you want because you might be angry and resentful and bitter and you might have your reasons for that. And, and that might contaminate your ethical structure, let's say, and make it so that there's large parts of you, that would be the shadow part from the Jungian perspective, who's, who's actually, that are actually after conflict and, and harm and cruelty and suffering out of spite and revenge. And then the probability that part of you is like that is unbelievably high because it's, it's very hard to be pure of spirit, let's say, given how much suffering and malevolence there is in the world and how much we're exposed to that. So it's very easy to take the low road. If you, if you are married, let's say, or you have a close relationship with someone and you, you want that relationship to be good, then the first thing that you have to figure out is, well, what do you mean by good? You know, so when I would say, well, good would be um, loving, let's say. And what that would mean is that each of you would be trying to take care of the other and yourself as if you're of equal import and that that import is high. And so I think that once you're married to someone, for example, or once you have children, and then maybe this the same thing applies to your immediate family, your parents and your siblings, is that probably somewhat less so for them, although still significantly, that you have to treat your spouse and your children as if they are yourself. And I know that's an old idea. And it's not often explained well, but you, you, well, and that also assumes that what you want for yourself is something approximating what would be best for you. And you'd have to figure that out as well. And, I don't know, it seems to me that, well, you want to like the people that you're with, and so you have to treat them well, and you want them to love you and to love them, I would say, at least to the same degree that you'd want that from a pet. You know, it's very nice to come home if you have a dog or another animal that loves you to have something there that's really on your side, that's happy to see you. It's one of the wonderful things that can happen well, in a marriage, but also when you have children. So you want to like the people you're around. You want to love them. You want to support them when they're having a hard time and vice versa. So you want to make your the vessel in which your family's ensconced watertight and, and capable of withstanding storms. You want to discipline yourself so that you're not doing things that you're ashamed of. You want to tell the truth. You want to work responsibly and be a good provider, whether you're female or male in 
whatever capacity you can manage. And I would say that also goes for children to the degree that they're capable of contributing to the family environment. And you have to think that all through. You want to embed your family in a healthy social life too, and in a healthy community life. But that all has to be conscious and thought through before you can start telling the truth. Now, how to balance between making peace and speaking truth in intimate relationships. What if truth hurts the other or two sides conflict? Okay, so the first thing you have to do is with the person that you're communicating with, you both have to figure out, well, what it is it, what are you aiming at? You know, I think it's in rule nine, which is assume that the person you're listening to knows something that you don't, that I outlined a number of different conversational types. You know, and there's the conversational type that's designed to mutually amuse and that can be lots of fun. And there's the conversational type that's um, designed to win. That's where I have a point of view and you have a point of view and, and we engage in a power dispute, especially essentially a dominance dispute where the goal is for one of the positions to come out on top and win. And then there's another conversation where the goal is to explore a problem and to come to a joint, to jointly further the understanding of that problem. And I would say that that's how you balance making peace and speaking the truth in intimate relationships is that, you know, the first thing you have to do is, well, you have to have a conversation about just exactly what the problem is. And that might take a long time and a lot of listening because when people are upset about something, they don't always know what it is that they're upset about and what they're upset about might be associated with a hundred other things that they're upset about that they've not dealt with. And some of those can be directly germane to the issue at hand, but some of them can be a consequence of, oh, old family trouble or old trauma, to use a very overused word, but trouble in the past that hasn't been dealt with properly. And it, it all amalgamates into a complex, that's the psychoanalytic idea that consists of all the problems that the person is dealing with that haven't been resolved. And then any new problem gets, it, it gets, it's poorly separated from that entire complex of problems. And so when the person is upset, then all the things they're upset about can sort of manifest themselves in, in a incoherent and chaotic manner. And that's really hard. And so if someone's upset about something, you or the other person might take a tremendous amount of listening before you can even get to what the problem is. And often, during that process of listening, there's a lot of mutual recrimination and accusations as each person tries to work it out. Because if you're annoyed at someone, and maybe all the other things that are wrong with your life are in the background driving the annoyance, but you don't really know it, you're going to accuse them of all sorts of misbehavior, some of it you know, with some justification, no doubt, and all sorts of inadequacies. It's not a good way of communicating but it happens a lot and then that person has to defend themselves like mad just so that they can not be the target of all that vitriol that's stored up for such a tremendous length of time so anyways you have to listen to each other a lot it's like okay what's the problem and then a rule there might be well what's the minimum problem it's like well our relationship is no good it's like, that's a non-starter for a discussion, man. Because um, you can't fix your whole relationship. You have to be more precise. You have to think, and maybe your partner has to help you figure out what it is that you're upset about right now that could be rectified. I mean, maybe you made a nice dinner or even a dinner that wasn't so nice and you got treated casually and with a certain amount of contempt while everyone was eating it you know they came in and grabbed the food and scattered to the four ends of the house and ate it and didn't bring their dishes back and didn't say thank you and you know you're very irritated about that and you have your reasons and you know the way you might respond to that is well this relationship isn't working but it's not precise enough you think well I have this specific problem I'm trying to make it a specific problem I'm then I'm trying to come up with a specific solution that might make this 
relationship, this part of the relationship work better. And so, look, you have to aim at peace. You have to aim at love and responsibility and mutual support. You have to want that for the people that are important to you in your life. And then you can start to talk to them because you're going to listen in the proper way. You're going to listen in a way that's aiming at that higher good, which is mutual peace amongst the members of the community. It's something that I learned, for example, from Jean Piaget, he called that an equilibrated state. And an equilibrated state is like a game that everyone wants to play. And so if you set your household up properly, then it's a game that everybody is participating in voluntarily. And that's going to be predicated on the desire for peace and the willingness to speak truth and the ability to take responsibility. So that has to be part of your higher order moral aim. And then when you're having a difficult discussion with someone, the discussion is going to be affected by that higher order moral aim. It's not going to be contaminated to the same degree by your desire to inflict pain and attain victory and, you know, crush your opponent and punish them for their previous sins and um, indicate your disappointment, in things they've done over the years and all of that. And so you can tell if you've got it balanced, by the way, Vincent, if the conversation continues. You know, when, when we used to sit down for family meetings, which happened on a bi-monthly basis, something like that, once every two months, when we were trying to div divide up economic and practical duties amongst my wife and, uh, and I and the kids. We had some rules, and the rules were, well, you know, there's a certain number of things that have to be done in the house to keep it running in a manner that anyone with any sense would want it to run. And there are certain responsibilities that everyone has to undertake to facilitate that. And there's difficult discussions that have to be had about who's going to do what. And so here's the rules. We have to make a list of what needs to be done. We have to agree on that. And then we have to each accept the responsibilities that go along with that in some sort of order. Maybe you choose one and then I choose one and then someone else chooses one, assuming that everybody's mature enough and capable of doing the jobs that they pick and that you have to negotiate until you come to the best solution that can be negotiated, which isn't necessarily a perfect solution, but it might be the best one that can be done. And then you have to stick with it until the next negotiation. And if you get upset during the negotiations, which you likely will, because these are difficult topics, how to divide up responsibilities in the house and people get mad because they feel they've been taken advantage of or aren't being listened to. One of the rules was, well, you can leave the discussion, but only until you calm down and then you have to come back because these things have to be pushed through. They have to be negotiated through because the alternative is, well, important things don't get done or people do them resentfully because they're sort of forced by their own orderliness or their own conscientiousness or or but we you know by force psychological or otherwise or on the part of other people these things have to be negotiated through you can tell if you've got the balance between making peace and speaking the truth right if the conversation continues and it can be emotional and will be and can be difficult because important things have to be dealt with but as long as people are still in the conversation and communicating, then, you, then you've got the balance right. You know, and you might have to take a break. Maybe you have to hold off till the next day. Um, maybe sometimes when you're negotiating something that's difficult, you have to offer the other person the opportunity to sleep on their decision too, which I think is often a very good idea. If you have to make an important decision in your life, it's very useful to tell the person that you're negotiating with that, look, I'm interested in this and it seems good, but I'm not going to agree until I sleep on it. it. gives you, well, lots of things happen when you sleep. You organize your brain when you sleep, at least to the degree that you can organize it. And you can often be more solid or more doubtful about a decision if you sleep on it. So